Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for meeting with me today. I am the Economancer. So I previously put out a video, um, well, two videos based on some of the work that Econ John was talking about and about communications theory and how it, you know, helps develop some of this argument. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people, you know, kind of not fully understanding what communications theory is. And so I figured today, I would take a chance to really dive into what communications theory is. And so that's what I plan to do. We're going to just jump into some basics of communication theory. I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be exciting. Um, it's not much math for this uh, point, but we will be jumping into math later. Um, so with this, we're going to start with basics of communications theory, then we're going to move into networks and social networks for economics, then we're going to jump back into uh, communications theory. And one of the reasons for doing this, because it seems like it's jumping all around, one of the reasons why is usually when these people are doing these major theory overhauls and stuff like that, they're writing books, I'm talking about like four or 500 pages, something that's going to be important for this one is the work done by Lewitt Leidesdorf. Um, it is called the evolutionary dynamics of discursive knowledge. And so he spends the first two chapters just going over the basics and the philosophy of it and kind of outlining uh, what's going on. And so some of that is going to be outlined in this video, though not all. And I don't want to jump too much on what uh, Loet does because uh, I would I think it would be probably better to just read his book. But at the same time, this isn't information that's actively out there in modern uh, economics. And so that's what I think is important. So we're going to be jumping into that. So this looks like a weird little thing. All right, we've got CI, CJ, CI1, CJ2. Why are those different? Why does that C1 say meaning? Why is there a C1 and I1 and I2? All right, so the first thing we're going to have to understand here is we have information, meaning, and economics. Well, first, what is information? So based on Shannon Weaver model, Shannon has that information is uncertainty, and it is not informative in reducing uncertainty. Um, now, later on, this is where Weaver comes in, it's cleared up that information is not meaning, and that information is a difference which makes a difference, something uh, we have previously discussed in some of our videos. So next is meaning. Um, though I plan on doing a little bit more deeper dive into what meaning is with a more extensive video, especially when it comes to this socio-cybernetic frontier, Basically, meaning is the attribution of the information and the shared reality of the information, which is what's known as double contingency. Um, so we have a more simple model here. We'll go into the semantic receiver and semantic noise model here in a moment. But what does this have? This is codification. So we have CI1 and CJ2. All right, these are the communicators communicating. So we have red and we have blue. This is information from CI1 and information from CJ2. The crossover of this Venn diagram is C1. That's the meaning. So we have information one, information two, provided by communicant one and communicant two. Right, I know, crazy. So what does this mean? So we have codes, this codification. And a simple way to think about this is how we talk about stuff. So one of the big problems that goes into modern economics, as well as modern sociology, as well as law, so on and so forth, these are all different systems. And what that means is, is they have different languages or linguistics or whatever, or different codes. And these codes create the evolutionary path for the communication of that system. Again, let's try to think of this very simply. You can't go to a courtroom and use language that's not based in law or else either, either the opposing lawyer will rip you to shreds or the judge will just not understand you or you'll confuse the people who you're trying to attest to, especially from the adversarial standpoint, you it just won't make much sense. 
So you have to use the language or the codes that are involved within the law. Same thing with economics. When you're talking to an economist, they're using a code. And if you're not understanding that code, then all of your information just so happens to end up over here because there isn't shared code. So if there isn't shared code, then guess what? We don't have a way to understand the information. So there's no meaning to it, even though there's information. So that's why you can try to tell someone something a million times. If they don't get the meaning behind it, the information itself is just out there. So now we can think of this another way. So we have a sender. Boom, this is sender SS, semantic sender. They're going to be sending over here to psh, 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 semantic receiver. All right. And then along the way, we have block, block. Right here is the place. So we can think of it this way. Boom. And then from here, we have noise. And noise is the thing that stops the amount of information being picked up. All right. So what is what is going on here? So we have this idea that I say something, person receives it, they understand what's happening. But that's not necessarily true. So semantic sender sends a message down this path. It gets garbled up here, and then it gets to this place over here. Boom. What does that information do? Nothing, because it, it's just up in the air. Semantic receiver receives the message and has to decode. What, what does that mean? So think of sending a binary code from one computer to the next. This information that's being given to the computer is just a bunch of zeros and ones. It doesn't know exactly what that computer just said to it. It has to decode that message. Now, there's a lot of stuff done by Shannon and Weaver, and then that's been built upon about redundancies and stuff like that, that make sure that the code from the sender to the receiver uh, gets matched. And that way we know what's happening. But we're not computers and we're not simple zeros and ones. There's a lot of information that's being given because it's not just what you say that get that goes from the semantic sender to the semantic receiver. There's there's your body language, right? There's body language. So that's soma. That's something to think about. Then we have uh, emotion. How is that getting through? That's going to be the soul. And then we have sometimes if you're talking to something serious, then you're going to have spirit. And we'll just leave spirit as spirit. That's something that's transcendental. So we'll just call that transcendental. Uh, wow. Um, and so, by the way, hold fast with me on this. I'm starting this to see if this works out any better, if this looks cooler or what, um, especially with some of these. It makes it a lot easier um, to do with that. Okay. So we can now take this and kind of expand on it a little bit. So now we have a signal into a message. Um, and then we have the receiver and that receiver can receive multiple amounts of information, right? So in this person can hear stuff from over here, uh, over here, over here, over here, so on and so forth. And so he's encapsulating here, encapsulating here and here. And that's that redundancy that I was telling you about, about information. So this is what he understands of each one of these uh, different individuals telling him. And that's similar to what that person said. Okay, so what does this mean? This generates redundancy by providing the receiver, receiver with uh, different perspectives of the same information, but different meanings, so different codes. So there's obviously more to this. And I would suggest checking out, again, evolutionary uh, Dynamics of Discursive Knowledge by Loet Leidesdorf. But what does this matter to economics? 
So first, when we're discussing consumer behavior, we make assumptions about how prices impact demand. By the way, I'm going to get rid of this, so take a picture. Oh, well, well. No, don't save, even though it's so pretty. All right, so we have demand. We know we're going to go over here. D. All right, so we have demand. And the we know that prices impact demand, so price up, demand down, price down, demand up, as a general rule of thumb, right? Uh, so, and then we also know the law of supply, right? When the change for demand changes, that's going to change in supply. I don't think I need to go through all of this. All right, but what does this matter with communication theory, right? Well, we can clean up some of the assumptions or at least describe them differently. Um, first, we can have a price as a signal from supplier to buyer. So price tells the supplier or tells the buyer what's going on. And then the supplier, um, the buyer decodes this information and the choice is expanded and solidified by generating other prices. So we have price of good one, right? So this is, uh, let's say a burger. So we know the price of the burger. And then we also have price two. This is burger two. So this is Mick and this is what, let's say BK. And then we have price three. This is burger. Uh, I don't eat fast food a lot, so I'm trying to think. Let's say Hardee's H D. All right. So these three prices, let's say they're different, obviously. So these give some type of information. And then we have person. He is hungry. And he wants to buy a burger. <laughs> so he, he wants a burger. So he's looking at these three different brands and he's given information on each one of these brands. All right. Now he also has other types of information that's associated with this. Okay. So he knows burger, bur McDonald's burger. It's let's say it's cheap, but flavorless. Cheap, or we'll say cheap, but small. And then we have Burger King. So let's say expensive, but, uh, what is it? Charbroiled? Char. And then we have Hardee's, middle, but, mushrooms or something you know all right so each one of these different pieces of information is going into this person so what this does is this expands the choice away from just simple prices which i don't think anybody in economics thinks it's just simple prices but when he decodes the information the choice is expanded and solidified by these generated redundancies between these different prices um, and thus the meaningful information is consumed by the buyer and i know this sounds silly because of this we can say some cool things about mar how markets allocate uh, resources First and most important, objective functions of a government. So we have G max. So we have this government that's trying to maximize its utility function. Uh, however you want to do that. It doesn't matter. And so what we can say is that a government can a government's objective function can never be perfectly known that's not perfect 
we make assumptions about it, but we don't know what it is. Now, why is it that we can say that it's never fully known? Well, that's because the decoding of the information can only distinguish what is meaningful. So like we were saying, we can only think about what is meaningful. We can only look at the code. Um, and because we have different groups of individuals that live within a country um, that are giving different code, coded frames or coded messages to the government, the government is trying to pick each one of these different groups and trying to work within that code where there's not one generalized, centralized code like in economics, we have a generalized medium of exchange, that's money, because that's a code that works around the whole system and can be answering to everything there. But when we're talking about government, the only like generalized medium of exchange that we have is votes, all right? So we have to assume that what we're getting or what we're getting for the government's utility or objective function is essentially the votes that they're getting. That makes up the answer. And so pe people in the government are not di identical for various reasons. There's obviously a difference between people and their government. Um, but that also provides a way forward through cumulative information or cumulative growth of knowledge as the redundancy. Uh, basically, this provides a mechanism and possible fix for the information asymmetry. Um, thus, even if a government or a business is given full information, the likelihood of all of that information being equally decoded, decoded um, is zero. Because only the information of shared meaning is decoded. Again, none of this is radical and can easily be... Uh, decoded from Kenneth Arrow's Economics of Information, yet the additional support from the Shanner Weaven model closes the gaps without additional work, meaning starting from a communications model, um, you can, you can, you don't have to backtrack to fix some of the problems which plagues modern ec economics as the foundation. Uh, because rarely these days with modern economics, the foundational texts are just a cursory glance in an economics textbook. And, you know, the reason why I say that is because there was, um, there's a, a lot of economists out there that, that have extremely advanced knowledge in some very particularized um, beliefs in economics. And, and I, I think highly of them for this because, you know, it's, it's hard to know all of this information all together. So what do I mean by that? So you have health economists. They mostly focus on the work in health. Then you have monetary economists. They're mostly looking at monetary economics. And so these codes that these you know different economists have are slightly different. And there's not a whole lot of generalized discussion very much at the most basic level. And so um, one of the things that Milton Friedman was famous for is he would ask his students very, very basic questions, right? Like, um, what is opportunity cost? And this was what Thomas Sowell said was like one of the hardest things that Milton Friedman was, did, would do is ask basic economic questions to see if his students understood not just uh, how to provide opportunity cost but what does it really mean what is the what is the full nature of opportunity cost what is the full nature of of marginal cost right so marginal cost or marginal benefit some people will give you a equation and be like this is it and it's just like that doesn't tell me what's going on um and there's numerous instances of of this in you know modern economics where uh individuals will point out that other economists have completely lost the basics and focused so heavily on something that the code that they're using is no longer relevant to the basis of which economics is done. And another thing to add here is that an economy is a system built on signals. We can all agree to that. Um, so we have receivers, senders, we have the decoding, we have meaning, we have selection, all at the individual and super individual level. And communications theory allows us to look at signals, receivers, senders, decoding, and understand how that decoding process works with people. 
Um, it helps us understand meaning and why some people would choose some things over others without having to uh, go too deep into rationality. Um, because if you're if you've ever done um, intermediate micro, you can know that some of the work done in rationality um, is is a bit difficult to look at, um, especially when you're trying to do proofs of it and stuff. Um, cause, so, breaking that transversality. Um, but yeah, but we can answer all of those questions from the communications theory just by focusing on how senders and receivers decode messages and how that may impact how an individual might buy something versus something else. And I think that's really, really important in uh, modern economics, especially as we move into the information age and, and move into uh, individual to super individual economics, which super individual is more collective. It's, a, it's above the individual. Um, narrative economics is, uh, is another way to think about it. Um, so I hope this is a good brief explanation uh, into this because, it, like I said, there's more that's got to be done. There's more that's got to be discussed. There's got to be discussion of intersubjectivity because how do we, how do we know that two individuals have to have the same code to explain the information together or why would that even matter? You know, so intersubjective intentionality is important here. Then we also have to think about the, the media theory. So how we discuss stuff and auto poetics, how the code that's used by say law creates the system itself of law and expands that code into its own system, uh, which is what autopoetics basically uh, says. Um, and then we, then we can look at not just linguistic codes, we can look at other types of, of, of coding information that may be familial, cultural, and stuff like that, because those codes also matter when we're talking about choices of individuals, because there's the constraining function of the material world that happens in economics and that's so how much money you make right but there's also a constraining function on what you would even think to choose a priori i guess and and the thing about this is uh, my set of goods is limited by one my knowledge of goods two by what i would think is a reasonable good to choose right so there are some people out there that will not buy meat. And so that entire section of food or goods is removed from them maximizing their utility. And so that's something to take into account when we're looking at, you know, this codification process. Um, and then what this will probably culminate into is looking at the triple helix model of Loet Leidesdorf and uh, really expanding on some of the mathematics. And if you're confused about that, the triple helix model is university, industry, and government government relations and how they uh, create innovation. So only by the process of communications between these three do we get uh, innovation, which is uh, built on top of some of the work done by Dosey. It's built on top of the work done by Schumpeter. Um, and it's built on the work done by Shannon and Niklas Luhmann. So it's actually a really, really broad and good theory. Um, and I think I'll bring it into the mix before too long. But with that, I hope this is a fun video. And uh, tell me in the comments below how bad my drawings are. And like, share, subscribe. Have a good one.